thank you to all of you who left me questions on my community posts. I'd ask you to just ask me questions, anything you wanted to know. And so this video is my q and I'll be answering your questions. And they were fantastic. Some of them, well, the one question really gave me and those around me some pause for thought. So I really appreciated those. Let me just have a sip of water. It's amazing. I still get so nervous when I sit down to talk and then my mouth gets dry sometimes, even though I'm getting more relaxed and I really do feel like you guys are my friends, my supporters, and I'm, I'm really enjoying doing these videos. I'm loving, I love the fact that you guys had questions for me. So let's start off straight away with the first question. I will put the question in its proper form on the screen. I won't say the usernames, maybe you guys want to stay anonymous, I don't know, but the first question was about sleep, whether I have any tips for sleep, and I'm assuming the tips are to do with um, sleep and menopause and perimenopause, So, but I'll, I'm going to answer it in general anyway. So for me, what's helping me with sleep, and it's not every, like last night I was up in the middle of the night, couldn't sleep because the door banged shut and I woke up with a fright, and I couldn't get back to sleep, but Right now, what's helping me is the progesterone. It's the micronized bioidentical progesterone, but it is pharmaceutical grade. It's eutrogestin. I have shown you in previous videos the pack. Um, I can put a picture of the pack on the screen. So the, the progesterone does help with, or the eutrogestin does help you feel relaxed and sleepy, but it's not like a sleeping tablet. Make no mistake. You won't be groggy. It's, it's not like you can't wake up. Another thing that really does help, I find at least, is melatonin. You, you can buy the little capsules. So melatonin is the sleep hormone that your body produces. Now, Andrew Huberman says he's not a fan of taking the capsules. He would rather you are in your own rhythm and you're producing your own melatonin. But I will say that melatonin helps me on those nights that I really just feel, you know, sometimes you get out of a good sleeping pattern and then you start to, or well, at least for me, start to get nervous and then I panic and then I'm like, am I going to sleep? I'm not going to sleep. On those nights, I do just take some melatonin. Um, the capsules I've got are three milligrams. So what I do is I actually break open. It's a little, um, you know, those, those ones that you can pull open. And then I sort of shake out um, one third because Huberman says you mustn't overuse melatonin. And he says one milligram is plenty. And he's right. If I just shake out about a third, about one milligram, and then I just swallow, put it on my tongue and swallow. It's actually got a sweet taste. Um, when I use that, I do sleep really well. And I find like my eyes are glued shut so much so that in the mornings, you've got to like really uh, unglue your eyes to, to wake up and open them. And sometimes like if I've taken a whole three milligram melatonin, I will feel very sleepy. Uh, and battle to wake up the next day. But within an hour or two, I'm up and about, and it's all fine. So I do find melatonin helps, progesterone helps. The other um, supplements that Huberman has mentioned, like uh, magnesium l 3 I didn't find that helped at all. Inositol, he talks about, I'll put a picture on the screen. It doesn't help me at least fall and remain asleep. Epigenin, which is like the active ingredient that you get in chamomile flour, so chamomile tea, you know, all these calming, natural things. Honestly, in my humble opinion, save your money that don't actually really make that much of a difference, unless maybe you are one of those people who are very sensitive to herbs and natural things. Nothing magnesium is good, nothing wrong with magnesium, but that particular form that he had recommended, I, I didn't find it helped me at least. So I always believe in saving your money and spending it on the things that really, really work. And if you are, let's say you don't want to go down the road of sleeping tablets, which when I was younger, for some reason I battled with insomnia and I know how shit that is. I needed sleeping tablets and they did get me through a difficult period of sleep. But then I, I did, I weaned off them very quickly because they are not good for you. They're dangerous, I think, long term. But melatonin, is such a good alternative and it's just natural to hormone. I also wouldn't want to get dependent on that because then what happens? Does your body stop producing its own? I don't know, but it does work in, in a bind. If you are battling to sleep because of night sweats, the menopausal night sweats, which I was 
suffering badly from last year and the year before, you need the HRT. In, in my humble experience and opinion, and I'm not a doctor, but the only thing to take the night sweats away is estrogen. That's what's worked for me. I find that that is the main thing that works for most ladies. There are other things. Um, I was reading in Menopause Manifesto, the Menopause Manifesto, there is some other pharmaceutical thing you can take, but I've never tried it. I don't know enough about it. But that is a great book if you do want to read on that. And then in general, with sleep, what I find helps. Now, this is a generalized view. If it's, if it's not to do with menopause, not more water, um, then you will need to just truly calm your mind. <sighs> because I know, for me, when I'm battling to sleep, it's because my mind is racing. It's thinking of all the things I need to do, I want to do, I've got to do, should be doing, haven't done, money, the, I don't know, the stress of life in general. So meditation really helps. Um, sleeping in a very, very dark room, as dark as possible, for me, really helps. The cooler the room is, the better. But I mean, in summer, if it's not... Like, I also don't want to waste money on aircon. You know, running an air conditioner at night, all night long, is expensive. So I do try and just sleep in very light clothing, kick the duvet off. I don't like a fan, something blowing on me. But these are all the things that do help. But when I'm battling, I always also just tell myself, you know, when I had my son and he was little and I was waking up throughout the night, I survived. It's fine. I know that all the experts are going on and on about sleep and sleep quality and how sleep is so important. And, and we all know this. But to have that hammered into your brain, then it makes, at least for me, it makes you freak out the minute you get a bad night's sleep. And I just have to remember that in the wild, not that we are in the wild, but people love to talk about caveman times and natural tribes and all that. They don't sleep through the night all the time anyway. I mean, they're also on very uncomfortable surfaces. There's lions ro roaring in the background. Who knows, whatever, you know. It's rainy, it's windy, there's storms. There's So it's not that we developed to only sleep solidly eight hours a night, every night in a darkened room with a perfect temperature. We evolved to adapt <laughs> and cope. So I think also to just relax around the whole idea of sleep is so important. That's my answer there. I hope that that helps you in some small way. Question number two. I'm going to save the best question for last. Question number two. One of you asked me about blood clots and taking estrogen. So she said that she'd had a blood clot due to being on the pill and that obviously you can't be on the pill if you have had a blood clot. Does that preclude her basically from using estrogen if she needs it as HRT? This is an easy one to answer. Look, again, I'm not a doctor. You've got to discuss all this with a proper medical doctor, of course. But I went to a talk by a local gynecologist here in South Africa where I live. And this question came up. One of the ladies there at his talk had had the same problem. She had had a blood clot. And obviously, obviously they didn't want to put her on tablet form estrogen. So no birth control pill in tablet form. But you can use, and this is what the guy said there, you can use transdermal, so th meaning through the skin, estrogen, which would be a patch or the gel. So I use an estrogen gel. Just wait there one second. I'm going to bring it and show you. I have shown it in other videos, but let me bring it quickly. Okay, here we go. This is the Femi gel that I'm on here. If you can see there, I'll get out the way. So this is a transdermal this is just estrogen. It is bioidentical. It's exactly like the molecule our bodies make. And there is no risk of increasing your blood clot. Well, there's no increased blood clot risk with using transdermal estrogen because what happens, and I read this in the Menopause Manifesto. Again, it's a great book, great read. Is when it goes through your stomach, it then hits your liver all at once. And then your body has to package up all that estrogen in the, in the tablet with little proteins. And that, those proteins have, like they thicken your blood a bit, a bit, slightly, ever so slightly. There's some clotting factors because they're all bound up all at once in proteins, the estrogen is. 
where it goes, when it goes through your skin, it's entering your bloodstream diffused and it goes through your liver slowly. It's not hitting it all at once. And actually, that's why tablet form estrogen, so estrogen taken by mouth, needs to be a little bit stronger because some of it gets, I don't know, through the digestive process. You don't absorb as much, whereas apparently transdermal, it gets absorbed really well all at once. So anyway, there's that. Like I said, I'm not a doctor, but this is what I've learned. This is what I know. Um, you can read the menopause manifesto and also just Google it, but definitely have a discussion with your doctor. The good news is you can take estrogen. So there you go. And lastly, the most fun, thought-provoking question I had was thank you for also for your support. This um, subscriber, questioner, often comments and often give me support. I really appreciate it. Thank you. She asked me about regrets, and I'll put that on the screen as well. How as she gets older, she's dealing more with regret, and do I have any advice for how to deal with regret? And then she put in brackets good and bad, which I'm not sure if she meant there's good and bad regrets, or some regrets are harder than others, or if my advice is good or bad. <laughs> I don't know, but I didn't want to just answer this question lightly. I wanted to take the time and really think about it, which I did. Fast asleep on the bed. He's always, always my shadow there, Yogi. I, I really wanted to give this question the, the weight that it deserved because, you know, when you're young, your regrets are sort of quite superficial and simple. Maybe like I regret getting tattoos. I mean, but those are not deep regrets because it, tattoos don't affect anyone else's life. So speaking for myself, the things that I regret are behaviors, decisions, actions that affected other people as well, not just myself. And obviously it's whether I acted in a way that I felt in hindsight not proud of, maybe I was ashamed, I said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing, made a big life decision that maybe wasn't great. So what I did was I asked my mom about this question and I got her perspective. I asked my partner and I got his perspective. And then I actually asked my son because I was just saying, you know, we, we were talking about regrets and obviously my son is only 15 or he will be turning 15. But he was just saying, well, you've got to learn from your regrets. And that is very true. It's a cliche, but it is true. And so ultimately that's how I look at regrets is that you a regret is there to tell you that feeling of regret tells you oh i shouldn't have done that that's really what that feeling is like i shouldn't have done that and i feel if if i look back on what i did and i learn from it and say you know what it was a mistake i now know better i will now do better and hopefully learn from it then that is what that regret was there to teach me that feeling is there to teach me not to do that again. Don't act in that way again. Take the lesson from that mistake. But I also understand that there are some actions in life that would create big regret. Now, I don't know what regrets you may be carrying, but I do understand that we all carry regrets. But I also understand, let's say, for example, a big regret I'm just thinking is if I were to maybe have had too much to drink, got in the car, caused an accident, and my actions would have had some life-threatening consequences for some people, that would be major regret. And that would be very, very hard to live with. I do understand that. So there is a sliding scale of regret, I'm sure, in life. But one thing I can say for sure, and I do know, is that every human being on the planet, I can tell you, has regrets. We all, there is no one who lives life without regret. It's impossible. It's impossible. Now, some people just brush their regrets off, don't look back, don't think about them. And that's fine. But I also think feeling the regrets, examining what you did, you know, that, that whole saying, a life uh, worth living is a life examined or something like that. Um, I, the examined life is worth living. Whatever that saying is, I, I do believe that that's true. So for me, you must look at your regrets. You must feel them. You should. And that's self-awareness. To me, having regrets shows that you are self-aware. 
that you are a kind, good, loving person, because if you weren't, if you were a sociopath, you'd have no regrets. You would just bulldoze your way through life. And as my partner said, now his take was that you've got regrets, but you learn from them. And maybe a way to make them less regrettable is to make amends if you did something wrong, said something wrong, acted in a way you weren't proud of, and repair. And I thought, sure, that was a spin that I hadn't even thought of. Is And it's like in the AA, you go and make amends. And I thought that is very wise. If if I've acted in a way that I shouldn't have or wasn't proud of or whatever, the way to deal with that regret that actually has a tangible healing power is to make amends, I think, at least. Say sorry. Go and help that friend out or whatever it is. What You know, I can't speak because I don't know what your regret is, and I think it's also individual. But if it was something that caused hurt or harm, make amends, go say sorry, help a person out, whatever it takes to repair the relationship, the situation, to the best of your ability. I mean, also, obviously, what's done is done. You can't undo the past. We all know that. We all wish we could. We can't. And as my mom said, I mean, she said she regrets some things as well. Obviously, she's got some big life regrets. But the way she deals with it is to be kind to herself and realize that she made those decisions to the best of her ability, even though looking back, she might regret some of them because she made them out of fear, out of uh, worry, out of whatever the case may be. Maybe her decision making wasn't the best, but looking back, it was the best she could do with her whole life situation, circumstance. You know, you can only do what you can do. You can only do the best in that moment. And that was my mom's take on it, was that you've got to learn the lessons from your regrets. Look back, what did I learn? Try and do better going forward. That's really all any of us can do. But I do understand that sometimes there's a lot of guilt around choices we made. I feel that too, definitely. And when I went to a psychologist, I'll actually link to that video I made here, here below, wherever I'm going to link it. And the psychologist had said to me, because I was suffering with a lot of guilt about all the things, uh, <laughs> all the things I'd done that I wish I hadn't done and said and whatever. And she said to me, the way to let go of guilt is you have to, in your mind, go back to that young woman you were who made, let's say there was a bad decision I made, that young woman who made that bad choice, decision, action. Did she do it intentionally to hurt anyone? I said, no, of course not. She said, well, did she do it? Like, to the best of her ability, was she making the best choices in that moment that she knew how? And I was like, yes, of course. And so she said, then you go back and you realize that fully, that the moment you made the choice that you now regret, back then, you were doing it out of your best intentions. Maybe sometimes they were selfish, but of course, we all need to be self-preserving. It's natural to want to be self-preserving and so we all act out of selfishness at times we might look back and say oh i shouldn't have done that but we're human <laughs> we're all human we all act in ways we look back upon and regret but to go back and say i did the best i could i didn't mean to hurt anyone and if you did mean to hurt someone and you're now sorry go back and say sorry or make amends to the best of your ability and even if those amends are to yourself to be kind to yourself, go back and say, I did the best that I could, and moving forward, I will do better. And I think, yeah, so there, there was a long answer to that question, but that is how I deal with it. I don't really dwell anymore on the past. But I did at one point, I was a bit stuck and ruminating on things I'd done wrong and regretted. And I just, that psychologist did help me, but I went back with the me that I am now to the me that I was then, and I just loved her, and I saw that she she really did her best. She really tried her best, and that's all any of us can do. So, yeah, I hope that that helps you. Quite a long answer, but I love that question. It was so deep and thought-provoking, so thank you for that question. It gave me, I love mulling stuff like this over. I love it. I love it. I could sit and have deep thoughts all day long. Um, 
it's why I read, I don't know if you can hear that bird or not, it's why I read psychology books, it's why I love Dr. Romani, it's why I love, well, it's why I studied psychology for a full year, I did a whole year of psychology, and then I did that Udemy course, which I've made a video on, I'll link to that as well down below, um, so I did that modern um, diploma in modern applied psychology, so I did that Udemy course, so I love why, like, why do we, why do we have regrets? Why do we stew? Why do we feel guilt? Why do we anything? Look, there's no one answer, but anyway, I love that question. So thank you. I really, truly hope that these answers have helped you. I love the Q&As. If you guys enjoyed the Q&A format, please tell me. Let me know in the comments below. I, I can do more of these type of videos. It's also maybe it helps you guys get to know me a little bit better because I do feel like now I'm talking to it helps me feel like I'm talking to real people. I think that's, it helps me, maybe it helps you. You might notice that I've been trying to really make an effort in makeup and hair for the videos just to look a bit more professional. I'm hoping that that does, I think it does actually make a difference. You know, not that I want to wear makeup every day. I'm certainly not somebody who can do that. I need a day's break from makeup. But I noticed today when I put on my makeup, my eyelashes look really long. <laughs> Uh, um, so yeah, I just wanted to tell you that I'm wearing the Maybelline Colossal Volume uh, Mascara. It's that yellow one. Let me get it quickly and show you. It is this one here. Let me move out the way. So I, I just thought if there's any good product that I just want to share, I'm not sponsored. At this point, no affiliate links. If I get them, that's great. I will let you know. I don't have any yet. But this is the best mascara in the world, I think at least. And it's not expensive. I've tried the Estee Lauder. I've tried, what was it? A Lang Lancome. Lancome. I don't know how to pr pronounce it. I think it was one with like a serum in it. That was the shittest mascara and it was the most expensive. I did not like it at all. It's like dry and clumpy and made them look very short. Uh, I always love to save money. Anyway, I'm going off tangent, but this is the mascara I'm wearing today. Love it. So I just hope to be helpful all around. Thank you for watching, guys. I will see you in the next video. Bye.